Good evening and welcome to Navigating the High School Years. On the behalf of the Counseling Department, we welcome you this evening. Um, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Lauren Moore. I am one of the counselors for grades seven through nine and also chair of the department. I'm gonna introduce you to everybody with us this evening before we start our presentation. Um, as I mentioned in the email, you can submit questions through the Google form. You can do that through the, the evening as you're watching the presentation and during question and answer time. Anything not answered this evening, you can feel free to reach out to us in days to come. For those that might be viewing later on um, in the coming weeks or days, uh, please again, feel free to reach out uh, to your child's counselor if you have any specific questions after viewing this recording. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start by introducing our three administrators I have with us this evening, Mr. Kyle Hosier, Ms. Sharon Flynn, and Ms. Mary Rose Joseph. I have my wonderful counseling team with us. I have uh, Ms. June Comitano, Ms. Jamie Brookman, Mr. Kevin Fleck, Emily Coleman, and Ms. Stephanie Fuentes. We hope you find this uh, helpful in kind of having a better understanding of what to expect through the high school years. I'm going to start our presentation and Junko Matano is going to start us off. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm going to start to talk about graduation requirements um, Senior from senior high school. Students will um, accumulate credits as they finish their um, classes at the end of the year, English and social studies, students will need to um, take four credits, math and science, three credits. However, uh, most of our students will continue to take um, more than three years of math and science. Um, so world's language, uh, the minimum graduation requirement is one credit from ninth through 12th grade. However, uh, most of our students will continue more than one year, one credit of world language. Um, and we know that most colleges really uh, would like to see two years of world language from ninth to 12th grade too. Um, health, taking it for half a credit is a requirement, art and or music. Again, the minimum requirement is one credit. However, our students, um, once they take art and music, seem to really enjoy the classes and they will continue to take art and music classes um, throughout their high school years. Many students do that. Elective 3.5 credits. Um, this will be accumulated by when, for example, students take their fourth year of math, fourth year of science, um, their third year of world language or uh, music, art, etc. Um, so that's how you can look at the 3.5 credits, physical education, two credits, students have it every year on their schedules. So a minimum total of 22 credits um, is needed for graduation. Please don't worry too much about credits since all the counselors will make sure that the students have more than enough credits to graduate. Um, and regents exams. So regents exams are not made by Edgemont High School teachers. It's a New York State exam. Um, so New York State will tell all the schools in New York State um, when these exams are offered. Uh, comprehensive English exam, uh, at the end of junior year, students will take it. Global History and Geography at the end of 10th grade. Algebra 1, uh, some of the students will take it at the end of 8th, or usually at, in 9th grade. Uh, science, usually starting from 9th grade, after students complete taking Earth Science and Biology or Biology. Um, at the end of the year in June, they will take a Regents exam in Earth Science or Biology. Um, U.S. History and Government, students will take it at the end of their junior year. Um, teachers will start to review for these regents exams in the springtime. They will receive um, plenty of past exams as examples. Um, so when our students are doing nicely in their Edgemont High School classes, uh, they will do very well on their regents exams. Next, I'm going to ask Ms. Moore to talk about um, other requirements. Great, great. So I'm going to give just an overview of our course offerings and various program options moving forward. 
Um, so as you know from emails sent regarding the course selection process, we're in the midst of that as we speak. So every year the counselors uh, present to students, teachers talk to the students as well about their various course options. Um, and then we meet with students individually for their final course selections. We'll be doing that next week. Um, as you've probably seen, we have various elective course options. Um, we have more as the year goes on, as the years go on. And some of our courses you'll see from the course catalog alternate year to year. We really encourage students to take electives, to take things they're interested in, um, passionate about, or think they could be interested in. It's a great way for them to explore um, new areas of interest or things that they know they already enjoy. Um, we do have different course levels. So in junior high, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, as you know, we have various English and math level options. Beginning in 10th grade, we start to also offer additional honors and AP level courses in the various subject areas. The AP and honors level courses are considered um, more rigorous. An AP course is uh, the curriculum is created by the college board and students will take an AP exam at the end of that course. Our honors level courses um, are created by our teachers, but I would say the same level of rigor as our AP level courses, um, just teacher specific curriculum. Uh, we want students to really think about balance um, in their academic schedule, particularly going in ninth into 10th grade where there are more options. So students might be recommended um, or, or told they're eligible to take a variety of honors and AP level classes. Um, and if that's the case, we really want students to still think about their balance outside of school. In a moment, um, Ms. Coleman's gonna speak to us about the um, options outside of school. Uh, and getting involved. And we see that it's just as important. So we want students to not feel like they're spreading themselves too thinly, have an ability to rest as needed. Um, so we want them to always be thinking about that. Uh, we do have the course catalog out. That's a really helpful way to take a look at our various options, flow charts with what's to come in terms of uh, future years. Um, and so students can start thinking about their course planning for this year and moving forward. Uh, there's a new layout this year, which uh, we hope is uh, more user friendly. It's divided by subjects. Um, and then there's some general information, um, such as our add drop dates, uh, grading uh, breakdown of our grading system also available. So please check that out if you haven't already. Uh, we also have some other two other options that are available for 11th and 12th graders. Uh, one of them is BOCES. That's a vocational program. It's a half-day program. So students would take uh, their classes here at Edgemont for half the day, and then they are bused in either the morning or afternoon, depending on their program, to our Southern Westchester BOCES location. Uh, there's a variety of programming available, uh, EMT services, animal science, culinary, sound production, just to name a few. We held interest meetings for our uh, current uh, rising 11th and 12th graders to let them know about those meetings. So those will be options for your children in years to come. Uh, if they want to, they can also take tours. So that's information we can talk to your students about next year um, or, or the year to come. Uh, Phaedrus is another option. Some people call it our A school. It's our alternative school. It's also a half day program available for 11th and 12th graders. Uh, so they would take half of their courses um, they're non-humanities courses within our regular Edgemont classes, and half the day would be within the Phaedrus program. They'll take their humanities classes there. Um, it's really seen as a small individualized environment uh, where students um, assist in choosing the classes they take, uh, really work together. There's a lot of leadership. There's intern experiences. Um, there's an application process and informational uh, sessions. Those are held um, in 10th grade. Um, and then the students would, if they're interested after exploring the program, perhaps sitting in on some classes, um, they're able to apply. Uh, so they do take a small a group of students each year. They really like to find a diverse uh, group of students. So students who um, are doing very well in, our, in our, our traditional school setting, perhaps those that are looking for something different, uh, students that are more leaders, students that um, might, uh, be working on those skills. So they're really looking for a balanced group um, for this special program. I'm now going to hand it off to Ms. Coleman, who's going to talk about getting involved outside of the classroom. Thank you, Ms. Moore. 
So yeah, I'm going to talk a few minutes about um, your child's involvement outside of the classroom and how it should be as meaningful and fulfilling as the academics are. So we in the counseling office stress the importance of being engaged throughout the four years, starting by encouraging all students to attend the activities there that happens at the beginning of each year. It is a great opportunity to learn about all of the clubs and organizations that are available to our students. Um, we have a variety of clubs that are led by our upper class students uh, taking on leadership roles. And what's really great is that the participants connect with others who have similar interests as they do, and then become club leaders when they are older. I do wanna stress it is not too late if your child has not yet joined a club. Uh, they are listed on the Edgemont website under the Activities tab. Additionally, our athletics program is also something that many of our students participate in throughout high school and is a great way to engage in our community while building important skills. While we have many of the better known programs like soccer and football, we also have more unique offerings like the ski team and gymnastics. More information about our athletics program can be found on the school website. Volunteering and working, especially as students get older, are additional activities that tend to be popular with Edgemont students. Uh, we have students who work at animal shelters, nursing homes, local hospitals, as well as find jobs on Central Avenue. This is a great experience for our students to learn to advocate for themselves and actively seek out opportunities. So here's the most important part. Think about the quality of what your children are doing after school, not the quantity. We cannot stress enough that our belief is it is more important for our students to find things that they're passionate about and be fully committed rather than spread themselves too thin by over committing. And we understand that there is a lot of pressure to do the right activity or be well-rounded for when college application time comes. However, colleges would much rather see a student engaged in a passion rather than just participate as a resume builder. And the admissions representatives have trained eyes to really be able to spot that. So they can tell when activities are authentic. So remember, it's less about what you do and more about what you do with it. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Mrs. Brookman, who is going to talk about the transcript. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. So the transcript is a history of all of your child's high school level courses, which consists of final grades only. Quarter grades do not appear on a transcript. So if a student has one quarter that isn't as strong as their other three, no one sees it once the grade is final. The transcript also reports Regents exam grades and the student's cumulative grade point average or GPA. GPAs are calculated after two complete years of high school coursework at Edgemont. For many, your student will receive their two-year GPA once the 10th grade is completed. The student's GPA will not change again until after 11th grade is finished. Edgemont's GPA is on a 5.0 weighted scale, which means that students can have a GPA higher than a 5.0. Our GPA scale is posted on our website. Many colleges will recalculate GPAs since there are so many variations so that the applicants are all on a similar scale. Keep in mind, behind every GPA is a story. Two students can have the same GPA, but very different profiles. Colleges look to see that the student is challenging themselves in courses that are of interest to them while maintaining an appropriate balance. Additionally, the transcript also represents the credit value that each course holds. So you will also see a total credit value once um, you receive your child's transcript. I will now turn it over to Ms. Fuentes. Thank you, Ms. Brookman. Um, so tonight I wanted to give you a sense of the role of the school counselor as we uh, move through the remaining high school years. Fortunately, we are really fortunate to be both a junior and senior high school because we have a unique opportunity for our students to really make that transition to high school with a counselor that they're uh, is well known to them. Um, starting in 10th grade, for those of you who may not be aware, students do get a new counselor who they stay with through graduation. So the counselors who work with students through, uh, in 10th through 12th grades 
are Ms. Brookman, Ms. Coleman, Mr. Fleck, and myself, Stephanie Fuentes. Um, they will remain, the students, in order for us not to be brand new faces to them in 10th grade, we just this past week went into um, social studies classes to talk about the course options for the coming year. And the 10th grade counselors went into the ninth grade classes because we are talking to them about planning for their 10th grade year. We wanted to make sure they knew who their counselor would be. And when we meet with them individually this coming week, they will meet with their 10th grade counselor. We reminded them that of course, Ms. Matano and Ms. Moore who remain their counselors for the rest of this year are also available to them to talk about um, their course selection because they know them well as students but um, they will meet individually with their 10th grade um, counselor. And we're really looking forward to meeting them next week. Um, at, this to, at the start of, um, so what are some of the things like that students want to be doing um, kind of in their, in their 10th grade year? Really their job throughout high school is to focus on their academics, right? And so focusing on their academics is always key. And then engaging in extracurricular pursuits. And I, just to repeat um, what Ms. Coleman said, it really is not more is more. It's really um, the quality um, of what you're doing with the choices kind of that you make. The counselors will continue to have that same role of providing academic and social emotional support, while also each year taking on a little bit more of a role in planning for life after Edgemont. Um, so it, again, in 10th grade, really it's kind of focusing on academics, engaging in extracurricular pursuits. If you haven't um, gotten involved in anything, it's maybe you can certainly ask your counselor. There are so many things to choose from. Sometimes it, it can be overwhelming. What might I like to try? Um, and I always, I like to remind families that extracurriculars are not always just um, an activity run by an advisor that works at EDGMA. It can be things um, certainly outside of school, certainly self-study, uh, you know, a student may teach themselves an uh, um, instrument or enjoy writing poetry or that kind of thing. So really just exploring themselves as individuals. Uh, and there are definitely students who have responsibilities to the home. Uh, they go home after school and take care of a sibling while parents are at work. And that is, absolutely just as valuable and and um, would never be penalized and and that is understood so um as students move into 11th grade um there are some specific uh meetings that are geared at planning for life after edgemont we usually in around november december of the 11th grade year have a junior post-secondary planning night this year um it was a panel of admissions professionals talking about various aspects of the college admissions search and selection process. Um, we just, uh, you know, this week started talking, uh, having individual college planning meetings with family, individual students. Everyone um, will have a meeting with their counselor and their family um, to talk about their, their individual process. We host a financial aid night, typically in May of the 11th grade, year for families um, and the counselors also host uh, towards the end of the school year just before summer of junior year a college writing workshop so that students can prepare over the summer uh, to start some drafts of pieces that may be required. Um, we also have some wonderful um, uh, website and tools that are available to students over the summer for those for, for planning those um, pieces of writing. Um, in the 11th grade year, we're moving, we're thinking more globally about college, we're thinking about demographics, we're thinking about visiting schools, doing research, and just kind of trying to figure out what are the qualities and, and, and characteristics that may be appealing. Um, and then in the 12th grade year, we do uh, all kinds of support. We continue, obviously, to focus on the academics and the social emotional support. And we will um, meet at a grade level meeting at the beginning of the year to discuss our particular application procedures. The counselors will meet with students throughout the process to make sure they have a balanced list of schools that they're um, applying to in terms of level of selectivity for admission. We will work on reviewing any pieces of uh, writing, essays or supplemental pieces of writing, and just general application support throughout the process. I should remember to say that we are here supporting the families as well, not just the students. We know 
kind of this can be a daunting thing to navigate and we are always here to support um, parents and stu parents, guardians, students alike. I, I will pass it along to Kevin Fleck, who will talk about standardized testing and career um, development and those types of things. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fuentes. So one piece of the uh, college application process that um, often comes up is something that all of us have been familiar with, and that is the role of standardized testing. This has been a conversation that has had a lot of uh, fluctuation in recent years, uh, largely due to the pandemic and uh, the rise of the test optional movement. Uh, <clears throat> so prior to uh, COVID-19, about a third of colleges, uh, well over a thousand colleges within the country already were giving students the option about whether or not to submit test scores to support their applications uh, because of COVID. Uh, that number rose dramatically with the vast majority, not all, but the very close to uh, students who um, had the option whether or not to submit test scores. And that has remained in place for the vast majority of institutions where uh, the colleges remain test optional, test flexible, uh, there's various terms. So uh, where that will be when uh, families, uh, when their uh, children are entering the college application season, part of our conversations will be where do things stand in terms of the use of standardized testing? Has it resumed being a requirement at many schools? Does it resume uh, being optional? And how to sort of navigate that? And that has part, been part of our conversations in recent years. Uh, assuming that students plan to have uh, standardized testing, should they need it for a college? Um, the process really begins in the junior year. Uh, the fall, we offer the PSAT to all juniors. Um, the format of the PSAT is a, essentially a miniaturized version, uh, mimics the format of the SAT, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in just a moment. Uh, it is a practice test, uh, hence the P in PSAT, as the scores are only seen by the student, the student's family, and their counselor. Colleges do not receive PSAT scores. <laughs> Outside of that, um, students who earn a certain index score on the PSAT are notified in late spring of junior year that they've been selected as high scorers and have been uh, entered into the National Merit Scholarship Competition, which is a process that then continues into the fall of their senior year. So with standardized testing, the question becomes which test makes the most sense to take for students. Um, either the SAT or the ACT are accepted by all colleges utilizing standardized testing, and there is no preference from colleges that one test indicates a stronger applicant than the other. Traditionally, you the test you took was really based upon which part of the country uh, you grew up in as the testing agencies are located in different vicinities. Uh, now we have seen students uh, across the country, across the world, uh, decide which test is better for them. So in addition to the PSAT, many uh, local uh, test prep uh, agencies, or if you go through the ACT website, there are free diagnostic uh, ACT uh, tests that uh, students can utilize to see is there uh, one that feels like it's a better fit than the other. Uh, the SAT has moved to a all digital format beginning with the March 2024 exam. Uh, it tests evidence-based reading and writing as well as math. Uh, the SAT, the ACT, excuse me, remains paper-based, so it is a bit of a longer exam. It encompasses math, English, reading, and science. And how the the tests are structured in terms of uh, switching between the different sections um, or whether they do all of they say their math at once uh, varies according to those two tests. So for students when they're navigating that process those are conversations they'll have with their counselors and we recognize in the college and career exploration and making decisions about life after Edgemont um, how do we sort of manage all, all of those resources and share information um, so we are uh, beginning to utilize a program uh, known as School Links. Uh, it is the primary resource students and families will have to assist in career and college exploration. It also will be how we manage the application process in terms of sending official Edgemont documents on behalf of students. 
uh, School Inks is a modern college and career readiness platform that helps students discover their interests and strengths. They can explore careers, they can explore colleges uh, and create an individualized career and academic plan that best reflects uh, their post-secondary goals, what they hope to do once they graduate from Edgemont. Uh, those of you who may have uh, older uh, students who have joined uh, the, the program this evening may recognize that this uh, sounds similar and is replacing the previously used software uh, that we have had for a good number of years. Naviance uh, School Links maintains the same relevant data that students were able to access in Naviance. One of the primary reasons behind the switch is School Links offers it in a format and layout that makes it more intuitive and more student friendly. It also uh, allows uh, parental access, which was not something we were utilizing through Naviance, uh, and it's a more robust way to uh, plan this journey effectively together. Uh, we've just completed onboarding uh, the juniors in preparation for their post-secondary planning meetings, and more information will for families will be forthcoming. We did send out um, a brief announcement about this uh, to uh, families in ninth and 10th grade, um, and we will be rolling out uh, access to uh, those grades later in 2024. Uh, at this point, I can now turn that back to Ms. Moore. Sorry, couldn't get unmuted there for a second. Uh, just as a reminder, um, on the EHS website, on the main page, you'll find the course catalog. Um, and then also on the counseling department website, we just encourage you to take a look if you haven't already. There's lots of resources available. In addition, we do have Google Classroom pages for each grade. So we we do post announcements there as well. Um, and for those of I'm sure you many of you have already seen, we also email a lot. So anything we email students, we also email home. Uh, so sometimes it'll just be a forwarded message or a direct message to you, but we encourage you to make sure your children have checked out um, the helpful information that we send along the years. I'm now going to open it up to questions. Uh, so I will moderate the questions and we'll just answer them. Please, if you haven't already submitted a question, please uh, do so now so we can make sure it's answered this evening. Um, so first off, we have two questions and they're both related to GPA. Um, wanting to know more specifically how our GPA is calculated at Edgemont. Uh, I'm happy to attempt to answer that one. Mm -hmm. I know it can seem uh, a little confusing uh, I know for myself, I've been at Edgemont, I believe this is my 17th year and the previous high school I worked at uh, did not calculate GPAs for students. So coming here was definitely a learning curve for me. Um, so at the, uh, as Miss um, Brookman mentioned when uh, she was speaking about the transcript, um, final grades are the only thing that appear on a transcript. And after a student has been um, in high school at Edgemont for two years, we will calculate a GPA. Uh, so the letter grades that appear on the transcript are uh, transitioned into a numerical valuation on our 5.0 weighted scale. Uh, we say it's a weighted scale, meaning um, that your GPA can be higher than five because we do weight our honors in AP courses uh, for a higher number to reflect the increased rigor of those when that number is calculated. So. Uh, for current students in ninth grade, let's say you end the year in living environment with an A, that becomes a five on our scale. If a student happens to also be taking honors algebra one, uh, that and they earn an A, that is converted to a six. Uh, those numbers are then uh, added up and they are divided by the number of credits. Um, a credit is a, a one for each full year class completed and 0.5 for each half year class completed completed, excuse me, uh, PE um, is not calculated into GPA as it is graded pass fail. And that's roughly how uh, the, the GPA calculations work. Uh, one other point just, and, and Ms. Brookman touched upon this already, uh, <clears throat> every GPA is different. Behind every GPA is a story and colleges by and large recalculate because every high school uses different scales. So where they, spend more of their time is really looking at what is the story the transcript is telling. Is this a student who um, has been very consistent across their high school experience? Is this a student who maybe ninth grade, that transition to high school was a little bit more challenging 
but they've shown progress and improvement year over year. Um, as the student maybe added some rigor, do they seem to be a student who uh, really hones in on those areas of extreme interest to them and they, they delve very deeply say into their humanities or world language courses and for balance purposes, uh, remain with regular level courses in science. Uh, so those are the, the things that are always being looked at on the college side. Uh, and the transcript is always the uh, piece that is looked at first, even prior to COVID when standardized testing was much more uh, common practice. Transcripts were always the first thing any college admissions person would tell you. And it's really beyond just that physical number that appears that we calculate here. Right. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, first, a thank you for hosting. You're very welcome. We're happy to provide this information to you tonight and be of support. Um, and the question was, um, I want to, um, what would you consider too rigorous of a schedule, of a course schedule? Are there limits in the numbers of honors and AP courses a students recommend, that we recommend a student take at one time? It's a great question and goes back to the theme of the night that we're um, emphasize tonight and we emphasize with the students all the time, which is balance. I'm happy to take that one. Um, so I think that is such an excellent question and I'm so glad it was asked. Um, it really depends, right? It depends on the student in question. So I think it's a very individual process. When I go into classrooms to talk to students about their coursework and all of us, we start with the idea of balance and about you can't just think about what is the most rigorous thing I could possibly take in this content area next? What is the most rigorous thing I can possibly take in this content area? Because you're not taking them in a bubble. You know, you really have to think about the entire course load and your extracurricular commitments, family responsibilities, health, time, downtime, time with friends, uh, more sleep than every um, adult <laughs> tells you you need to get more sleep. And so it really is individual by student. I think a good reminder, and definitely someone said this earlier, is that when you see uh, tomorrow at the end of the day, you'll see the course um, recommendations or level placements that um, teachers have recommended for core content classes next year. And that's not a, you definitely have to take this. That is a, you have met eligibility to take this. And then it's the individual student and the family responsibility to have the conversations with teachers, talk to your counselor, and what makes sense for you. Um, there is no, you must take this number of honors or APs to equal um, uh, being impressive to highly selective college for admission. There's also, unfortunately, very, very few students who take the highest level in every um, subject area, and even fewer who do that at no cost. Right. And so it depends on, you know, each student knowing what it takes for them to succeed at the level that's important to them in a particular area. I highly recommend challenging yourselves in the area of interest to you. If you find your if you, the conversation sounds like I think you should, I heard that it's best to it has to be what is right for the individual student. Um, at this point in time, other than prerequisites um, to fulfill, uh, to be able to take a higher level class, there's not a, a maximum. Um, I think it's an important conversation with each uh, student, with their family and the teachers and counselors. And we're happy to have those conversations. Thank you for the question. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Also related to that, just to, to loop back to that course catalog, one of the tabs in the course catalog is criteria. So almost all of our AP and honors level courses do have a criteria that the departments use in making their recommendations. Um, so that's something to check out too. Uh, the next question is, um, is it typical for students to take two science classes in 11th and 12th grade? Uh, for example, taking AP level courses in biology, chemistry, and or physics. Um, the answer is no, we've we've not ha typically had students that take two science classes in a year unless they're taking our science scholars class, which is an elective that's separate from their core science class. Um, one of the reasons is we've got um, lab periods attached. So as you know, as you're familiar with uh, 
any high most of our high school sciences aside from our electives have a two period lab um so that looped with uh pe would make it very challenging to fit the schedule the only way to do so would be to um discontinue taking something like world language uh which would be an individual conversation to have but we would be hesitant as um a counseling team to suggest a student um not take a world language uh given it's something we know many colleges are looking for um in the application in the future application process down the line again you can have an individual conversation but the answer is no we actually have not had a student take two sciences in the years um unless again it's an elective or science scholars um, the next question is sorry let me just scroll down uh is there any guidance about the new online sat wants to jump in sure i can i can jump in quickly um so the the new sat as mr fleck mentioned is going to be digital um it started internationally being digital last year um but starting this march all national test sites will be using the digital sat so going forward there are no more paper versions of it now there is just um uh, the digital version. And there are some main differences between them. I think the, the biggest is, is that it's almost an hour shorter um, than the paper version was. And the reason for that is it's an adaptive test. So while you take it, each section is, is divided into two. The first part and how the student does on the first half of it then determines the questions they get for the second half of that section. So if you are doing really well, you'll start to get harder questions. And if you are struggling, then you'll get questions that become a little easier. And that's how they gauge what uh, your score is going to be. As far as we know, um, the scores for the for the digital SAT is going to be the same um, as the paper one in terms of um, the averages equaling out to each other. So colleges don't need to modify their own data about, you know, what the middle 50% is based on the new uh, SAT. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes in March. Um, it's a very big undertaking. And it's, you know, when you're thinking about which test to take, um, you, a good thing to ask is, are you good on the computer? Or would you rather take something that's pen and paper? And if that's the case, the ACT. If you have any specific questions about testing and, and um, you or your child specifically, um, always feel free to reach out to your counselor as well. We can we can help navigate that with you. And I would just add, um, if for families, if they're looking for, say, free preparation resources about the digital SAT, College Board does um, partner with Khan Academy. So if you go through the College Board website, collegeboard.org, um, <clears throat> click on SAT and scroll down, you'll be able to find resources that will assist students with preparation. There was a, actually also just a, a similar question about um, taking a diagnostic to see if the ACT is a better fit. Many of the local uh, test prep companies will offer uh, a free diagnostic. Um, you are not required to then sign up for their services, and it's not that we in, are endorsing that you must, uh, but if you wanted to have that exposure, to make an informed decision in addition to conversations with um, any of us as the counselors, uh, you know, that, that would be another uh, resource to utilize. Great, just I noticed embedded in that question was a note about the school links email. Uh, the school links email was sent out to all families grade seven through 10. There was a separate run for our current 11th graders about a month ago. Also now on our website is a school links page with all of that information. So if you uh, perhaps missed that email, please feel free to go to our counseling department website. There's a tab for school links with some links to read more about it. And again, like Mr. Flex said, uh, we will be sh sharing more information soon about onboarding for the younger grades and some activities that they can do to start getting familiar with school links. Uh, the next question is in the course catalog. Thank you for looking at the course catalog. Um, is uh, says an independent study is an option in junior year. The question is, how does that work? And when does the decision need to be made? I can answer that. So students who are interested in an independent study course they would find a teacher who would be able to advise them 
on that specific course. We do not offer independent study courses to students um, where we offer the course during the school day. So for example, if a student wanted to take forensics as an independent study course, we wouldn't have that approved. It wouldn't be approved because we offer it as a classroom class. So it would have to be something outside of the courses listed in our course catalog. Students would earn a half a credit in participating in an independent study. They write up a proposal with, a, with a, the teacher who will be um, doing the work with them and it has to be approved through building level administration. And again, they would earn a half a credit. It would go on their transcript and they would earn a pass or a fail grade, not a, a traditional letter grade. So um, that's how it would be viewed on the transcript. And they certainly can tell their colleges when they apply to those that they participate in an independent study course. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do most 11th graders take physics for science? I'm happy to answer that unless somebody wants to jump in. Um, I can answer. It, re it really varies on the student. Um, you'll see if you look at the flow chart again in the course catalog, um, you'll see that in 11th and 12th grade, there's a lot of options for science. Some students choose to take physics. Um, some students choose to take all four of our regents level classes. So earth science, biology, chemistry, and then physics. We also have a variety of AP level courses. Uh, we have our elective science courses as well that students can take in 11th and 12th grade. Um, so it really varies on the student. We we do encourage the students to speak with their science teacher uh, to make sure they're picking a class where, again, they're going to meet with success and also classes that they're interested in taking. Um, so many of our students do take physics, uh, but some choose to take other science classes along the way. It really um, depends on the student and their interests. Uh, the next question. Can I just say, what, can I just add sure, one thing about the electives? Can. Um, sure. In the, the science electives, the half year electives, um, do uh, take note, and this may have been said earlier, uh, the course catalog, some of the electives will be happening on alternating years and the course catalog will say the year that it's running. So this current year presently, it's forensic science and anatomy and physiology. Next year, it will be forensic science, um, astronomy and neuroscience, if there are enough um, requests to fill the, to um, equal uh, sections of those classes. And I, I think I mentioned this, this earlier, but if I didn't with the other, a lot of our other electives, the same is true. There'll be an alternating year. So some of our art classes um, and some of our other electives in the various areas, they're also noted as Ms. Fuentes said, um, which years they're being offered. So again, for course planning purposes, and we spoke to the students about this in the classrooms as well when we were in this week. Um, we have one more question here. Um, it is, can parents meet with their student's counselor uh, to discuss, review the college application process? And do we recommend an outside counselor? Want me to take this? I can't, I can. I'm happy to, okay. I just so want to like answer me. all the questions. <laughs> I feel um, like the same way. <laughs> right. Um, can you repeat the question? I got this. Okay. Yes, of course. So absolutely, um, families will all, like in the 11th grade year, second semester, um, parents and or guardians and students will meet individually for, for a period um, with their counselor. Um, that's the kind of more formal process. You know, whenever parents have questions, um, you can always reach out to a counselor. We're very responsive to email. Um, we will, we can, you know, hop on a Google Meet, have a meeting. In terms of like really going through the process of, like, you know, the formal conversation about the college process, we do um, have that starting second semester junior year. We very much want students to focus on being high school students in and of itself and not just kind of that as a launch pad for the next step. However, of course, during um, it always, you know, it can certainly come in when we're talking about course selection and course planning. We often talk to students, maybe we're talking to a current ninth grader about what they are thinking about for 10th grade. And maybe we're talking about science. We're like, oh, you know, what were you think? Okay, if you take that in 10th, what were you thinking about maybe for 11th and 12th? So we do talk about kind of being mindful about planning ahead while being open to pivoting if that's not, if it turns out not to kind of be a great option. So we do not have kind of hour long 
uh, college planning meetings until the second semester um, of the junior year, but we absolutely work with families. Um, in terms of the, should we hire someone outside? Uh, you know, certainly the counselors at Edgemont and forgive me for me being one of them is that like we can all do very well what the um, outside people do. It has to be, we cannot endorse, you know, a family spending their money in a particular way. Um, you, it's, there are services that maybe are provided um, in a different capacity, you know, nights, weekends, summers when, you know, counselor, you know, we don't work, but we've, we, uh, it's it's not necessary. Some families choose to do it, um, you know, to help organize that family and and maintain the parent student relationship in that in the house. Um, but yeah, that's we can't really advise, you know, someone to or not to. I just want to add, um, echoing Miss Fuentes, I think our department is very comprehensive. Um, we're excited to start to use school links um, from the younger levels. Ms. Moore and I are planning to use the career piece and start to talk about their dreams and future um, planning. And then, um, you know, definitely ninth grade, we welcome um, parents and students asking us questions. We speak to them a lot. Um, email is the best way to uh, contact us. And if a phone conversation is better, we will always um, reach back to parents. Um, another important thing is um, junior year, every student and parent, like Ms. Fuentes said, um, will have a meeting with their counselor about their future college planning or um, after graduation planning. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, the question about, um, you know, should I have a private counselor or not? I think that's a real, you know, family decision. Um, but I think we all feel that, you know, we really work with the students and parents closely and it's never a necessity. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. And that round out round outs our question for the, the evening. Um, so we do not have any more questions. We again, thank you for joining us this evening. If you are watching this recording later on, like I said earlier, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to your child's counselor. Uh, and we look forward to working with